Venom! Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today we're gonna dive back in to more donations from Cam Fraser, our friend who's been sending me all the digital codes for pretty much every King and Black tie-in. And so I wanna give another thank you to Cam. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this, to provide content for this channel. And you know, I said before, I was going to skip all these mainly because of finances. I just thought there was too many King and Black tie-ins that were coming out. And I was like, I can't keep up. Plus, I was so burned by Absolute Carnage that I was like, I, I can't, man. Those tie-ins, some of them were really good. And I thought they set up certain characters that could have really used really big moments in the main series. And they never got them from Donny Cates. And so that really, you know, disappointed me. And so I felt this time around, I was like, well, why would I give these other books even a chance because, you know, what does it matter? They're, they're not going to have big moments that you know, tie into the main books or pay off. Or some of these might not even get main moments because, you know, I think in Absolute Carnage, a lot of the writers were like, hey, here, I'm setting up a good moment for, you know, Miles. Or I'm setting up a good moment for Scream or some, you know, other characters. And then Donnie just didn't do anything with those setups. And so I felt the same here. I was like, oh, is it just going to be a bunch of writers who are like, here, please, do something cool with my characters in the main book so that way hopefully people will now come and read my books and yeah i haven't seen a lot of that i've read the first four issues of king and black now and we will cover king and black four when venom 34 comes out and we'll do like a live stream with those two like we always do um but i haven't seen a lot of crossing over and stuff and so a lot of these as i'm reading them they seem very pointless as king and black tie-ins but surprisingly in the last episode, I still liked some of the books in general. Like, I'm actually really thankful to Cam for donating to, donating the books to us for that reason. Like, I just was like, all right, this was nice. Cam wants to just hear my thoughts on this stuff. And that is very flattering. I was like, hey, thanks. Like, if, if I mean, if you want me to discuss the stuff and you're, you're willing to donate them, I'm happy to make videos on them, definitely. But what I didn't expect was that I was actually going to like the books as they were. Not as King and Black tie-ins, but just like if you took the symbiote elements out of those stories and replaced them with anything else, which you can do in most of those books we already talked about, and some of the ones we'll talk about today, um, they were still decent books. And so I got to thank Cam. Got me to read some books that I probably never would have given, a, I mean, I wasn't going to give a chance to any of these. And I'm, I'm glad I am. I'm glad I'm reading these. So we have a couple more uh, today. We're going to do another five like we did last time. Five might not be the number we do every time. I'm trying to group them in a way, and a lot of these have like three issue miniseries, but not all three are out yet. So I'll probably wait till they are, and some of those issues will probably, our episodes will do like six issues in an episode, so we can do two, three issue miniseries. So the numbers of, you know, books we do in each episode will vary, but I figured just for, since it's our second episode, I'll try to keep it a little uniform if I can. And we're just going to talk about five different issues today, uh, but two of them that kind of cross over with each other. So first up, we're going to talk about the union. We're going to talk about issues one and two, because apparently this is the one and two of a five issue storyline, uh, like a five issue miniseries, but only the first two issues tie into King and Black, which makes me wonder, like, why didn't they just write this and set it after King and Black? Like, and then when I read it, I'm like, same thing. I'm like, if you just took the symbiote element out and replaced it with any other villain in the Marvel Universe, anything, phalanx, like, you know, the brood, anything, it would be the same story. And so those are the things that why I don't think these books should be King and Black tie-ins. They're just there for cash grab purposes. Um, but again, on some level, I'm grateful for that because they got Cam to donate them to us and then I got to read them. And again, I got exposed to books I never would have even given a chance to before. So I'm glad I'm here to talk about this stuff. So we'll talk about the union first. And again, there's going to be spoilers about all these books that we're talking about today. So if you don't want any, you know, uh, come back after you read these books. We're going to talk about the, the union uh, we'll start with. And then I'll announce each book as we you know go through the uh, episode. So the first one, this is uh, by Paul Grist. I think he's like the writer. I'll have the credits up on screen there. He's the writer of this issue, but he's also the co pencil artist along with Andrea DeVito um so that was pretty neat to see Paul Grist as the writer and co-artist uh, uh you don't see that a ton a lot in comics nowadays but when you do like Sean Gordon Murphy, Murphy or other people like I kind of I like that level of commitment because writing is difficult and art is very difficult so to be able to try to do both is uh, you get my respect automatically whether I like the book or not you still get my respect um but this starts off with this uh, new team. It's very political, this book. Um, 
which I don't mind too much because I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by the concept. But basically all of, you know, the UK countries, you know, I guess like Ireland and Scotland and, you know, maybe Spain and, and, uh, and you know, England, obviously, and a couple other places, like I guess they're all kind of pulling together to create a super team to help unite their countries. Um, because I guess they're talking, I guess they're kind of alluding to things like Brexit and stuff like that and politics in general without coming out and saying it, that they're heavily alluding to it. They're like, oh, our country is falling apart lately. We don't, you know, our countries don't understand honor anymore or this or that or, or respecting each other's, you know, um, or respecting their neighbor. Or, you know, it's kind of stuff like that. I mean, stuff that probably all countries feel right now because you know, the world just makes us want to hate each other. And, uh, you know, people in power and people with money just love to make everyone else hate each other. And they get, they try to give us the superficial reasons to hate each other. So that way we'll just argue with each other and ignore the horrible things they do. Um, and that, that's my opinion anyway, not to get too political, but this book is, uh, about Britain pulling together a new superhero team, uh, that they're calling the union. And it has a uh, Britannia on it, uh, some character named Snakes, uh, who's like this big hooded guy, looks really creepy. Um, the Choir, uh, who is, uh, she's got like her, something covering her mouth, kind of looks like Chamber a little bit from the X-Men. Um, I thought Chamber would have been a cool member on this team, but I guess mutants don't play well with others right now, uh, f for whatever reason. Um, and then Kelpie, although the X-Men did show up in this in King and Black, but I mean, they just showed up to get possessed. <laughs> That's really like their main contribution. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, and you have Kelpie. So you have, these are the four characters, but then they also add in Union Jack as well. And they're running a, a capture the flag type exercise in the first issue where their uh, Union Jack is kind of narrating a little bit. He talks about how he's the newest person to wear the costume, the Union Jack costume. He's not one of the previous Union Jacks. And he doesn't have any superpowers. He's just super athletic and, you know, and, and pushes his body to the limit. So he's kind of like a Batman or someone or like a Punisher. So there's nothing enhanced about him. So I kind of like that. I thought that was kind of neat. And Britannia, though, she's like the one that the media is hoisting up and like this military group that is putting all these heroes together. Like I said, it's very political. So they... They're, they put this team together and they put her on the team because she's kind of like a female Superman. She's, you know, dark hair, uh, really good looking, you know, in shape, got a cape. You know, she looks very heroic and stuff. And so they're like, all right, she's going to be our our leader of this team. And and the media is helping with that. So you kind of see the, the marriage between politics and media, which, again, I don't know how much like Paul Grist is like where he stands on the political spectrum or if he just was like, hey, let's just write a book that that I feel would happen if, if like if it's like someone like maybe an editor presented him with an idea like hey we want to do something about these characters and this was something he came up with from that um I don't know I don't know how this story developed but it's it's intriguing like I, I think it's neat to see that this super team is kind of hoisted up by the media and then whenever the media is like trying to ask them questions they the the military group kind of tucks away Britannia and put Union Jack out there in the front of the cameras, um, and they're and then the media gets disappointed with that. And there's like so there's like this like game that the media and these politicians are playing in a way, and this government group is playing. And I'm like, oh, that feels very familiar. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I kind of just found that interesting. And meanwhile, while that all that's going on, of course, a dragon shows up, a null dragon, and uh, they uh, Britannia really quickly makes short work of it, cuts its head off, but. As she cuts his head off, its tail swings around, comes up behind her, and stabs her uh, through her chest and stomach and kills her. So uh, so right off the bat, you, they lose their superhero leader. And again, if this wasn't a King in Black thing, like I would probably be locked in more to this story. Because, uh, you know, you could have had some random villain show up, and then they could have spent the next four issues trying to figure out what that random villain was. And then maybe you can reveal that. Britannia is not really dead and that the the villain that showed up to kill her in the beginning was just a fake a plant thing um, to you know to kind of get Union Jack into a leader position so he'll play ball you could have done interesting things like that but because it's like literally random and they're never going to explore null and any of that past these two issues you're just, I just kind of like well, what's the like why like uh, so again I feel like a lot of these scripts were probably written and 
then someone at Marvel was like, oh, can you also make it tie in the King in Black? And then what seems like is most of the tie-ins I've read so far is that they just put in one of the Null Dragons, and that's kind of it. Uh, so that's, and that's like how they tie in. They're like, oh, we'll just have, just have a Null Dragon show up, and uh, and that's it. Meanwhile, there was like millions or so many Null Dragons flying towards Earth, and I know a bunch of them got blown up by Tony Stark with the satellite, but so many more landed in, and then there was like Celestials possessed by... Uh, you know, um, symbiotes and stuff that landed in New York, but then every other country in the world just gets like one dragon. Like it, it's, <laughs> it just seems so, so bad. It, it's so poorly planned and, and not well executed. Um, but uh, as the Null Dragon's head got cut off, it's still active. It splits apart and it takes over the team that uh, the Union heroes they were playing against a group of soldiers in a game of Capture the Flag. So the other, uh, the, the, cap, the team they were fighting against in Captain Flag, they get possessed by the Null symbiote. And then now at the end of the first issue, they got to go and like attack, you know, the Null characters, like the Null team or whatever, or, like the, the, the opposing Captain Flag team, as, but they've been nullified. So, uh, so then we lead into issue two here. Paul Grist again is doing the, the art, I mean the writing, uh, but it's just Andrea DeVito who does the pencils on this one. And again, this is the uh, Britannia Project Part 2, Making Waves. And I like Andrea uh, DeVito's artwork, actually. Uh, Paul Grist at art on the first issue did some good stuff, but uh, I really like just Andrea Solo in this one. Like, uh, Andrea's stuff is really cool. It's like very clean lines. Not that they weren't in the first issue, uh, but just uh, the first issue was two styles kind of blending together. Having one consistent style on this issue was really nice. And so uh, so you have these symbiote soldiers attacking the characters, you know, our heroes, uh, but then the symbiotes get defeated by the choir, the girl with the, the screaming power. And uh, and so she's got like a voice that can like send sonic blasts or whatever, kind of like, not not exactly like a black canary, but she, she like radiates some kind of energy and it. It, it shoved all the symbiotes back. But then the symbiotes went off of the soldier bodies they were on slinked on the ground and went up and covered the choir so now the choir is possessed by a symbiote and is off doing something as she knocks out the whole team so when the whole team wakes back up because i was sitting there going why isn't it pitch black out like why isn't the sky covered like it's supposed to where's the continuity well two pages later my foot went in my mouth and they showed the continuity when union jack wakes up from being unconscious and he's talking to his like sleazy businessman and the political guy that you know kind of oversees the team um, him and the team regroup and the sky is pitch black and he's like what's happened and they're like we don't know like the sky just went dark and but we did track the choir and she's over in this location so uh and she's at a carnival or something and, and we got to go stop her so that's pretty much the rest of the book is that the team goes to battle her and uh and you know at, at like think of the last minute someone throws a sword to Union Jack and he grabs it, stabs it into the ground and hits like an uh, electrical box where it's like an electrical sword and stabs it into like a, um, like, cause I think they busted something and some water spilled in or like a, a half tsunami came in and made everything wet. And then, so he uses the electric sword, pops it in the ground and it electrocutes the choir and destroys the symbiote off her and uh, her body falls to the ground and she's saved essentially. Um, but that's pretty much where the book ends. It's like they, they beat this one symbiote thing uh, they lost Britannia, and then now uh, Union Jack is being led up by the press to be the new leader. And he's like, well, I don't want to be the leader. The, the political guy's like, well, and the Kate, you, you signed a contract with us. And if something happened to Britannia, you were going to be the leader. And he's like, I'm not going to be the leader. The team just quit. Like all the other members, after everything they went through in the first two issues, they're like, screw this. We thought superheroing, being superheroes was going to be a completely different thing, a different experience, but instead it, we saw someone die right in front of our eyes, so we don't want to be a part of this anymore. And so uh, so Union Jack's like, all right, fine, goodbye. And then he finds out, wait, no, I'm the leader now, but my team just quit. And they're like, yeah, you got to go get them back because you guys have, you know, uh, a, a conference to make in the morning on a morning, you know, news station. And uh, they see the media is already propping up. Um, Union Jack to be the new leader. So again, the kind of those games that, uh, you know, po politicians will play and how the media is involved in it and stuff. So I was like, ah, it's again, not, not a terrible, terrible comic, just a terrible, terrible tie-in. Uh, the next book we're going to talk about is the Black Panther one-shot that came out, which is by Jeffrey Thorne, um, who I hope to get on the show at some point because he wrote not only this that I'd like to talk to him about, but also um, he, he wrote uh, the 
I think it's Planet of the Symbiotes number two. There's a short story in there about Hobie Brown, who's, as you know, if you're a longtime watcher on my channel, I'm a huge, huge fan of. Um, and we'll, I don't want to spoil that story, but we'll talk about that in a future episode. But I definitely want to try to get Jeff Freethorn on here because Jeffrey was someone I used to know when I worked at Golden Apple Comics. He would come in weekly and buy his comics, and he was a writer, and you know he's uh, getting his scripts out there and everything, and it's so good to see his name on comic books right now. And he's doing like characters I love, like Hobie Brown, Black Panther, and Green Lantern, John Stewart. So uh, I'm definitely gonna have a lot to talk to him about for sure. But that'll be a fun episode coming up in the near future. Hopefully, I'm gonna try to. I, I reached out to him earlier, and I, I think we can make something happen. So um. And we also have uh, uh, German uh, Peralta as the artist of this book as well. Art in this issue is really good. And actually what I really like is I like the script overall. Uh, and this isn't me just trying to kiss Jeff's butt. Like I've been a fan of Jeff's as a person for a long time. And I really like the guy. And I'd see him at conventions and everything. He'd always ask how I was doing. He's a super nice guy. But I'm still critical of people when they write things I'm not a big fan of. This happened to be one of those times where I'm like, well, it's going to seem like I'm an ass kisser because I actually like this issue. Um, there's like one thing in the Hobie Brown story I didn't like too much, but this, I couldn't, I didn't find a lot of stuff I didn't like in this. This was really neat. This is the symbiotes invading Wakanda. Um, there will be one critical thing I have to say at the end of this, but for the most part, um, I did like this, this book, this issue. Uh, so go pick it up. I would say go pick this up before we get into spoilers. So... What we have here is if you've watched the movie Black Panther, you'll be very much at home reading this book. I feel like this has characters in it like Okoye, you know, and uh, and Shuri, who are characters that have been in the comics before too. But they uh, the artist very much like bases them off the movie versions, uh, which is fine. You know, um, I, it's I think it's okay for synergy sometimes to do things like that. And I think this is one of those instances where this is just a cool. Black Panther one shot you can put in someone's hand. You're like, hey, you like that movie? Check this out. This is what if Wakanda got invaded by, you know, aliens, which you saw in Infinity War. Um, it's also happened in the Scroll Secret Invasion stuff, which they reference in this book. So it's like, here's them getting invaded by symbiotes, like Venom symbiotes. I think the average person who doesn't know much about comics would probably, their interest would be piqued by that. That, that elevator pitch, like, hey, it's Wakanda being invaded by Venoms. It's like, oh, wait, what now? <laughs> and uh, and that's kind of what the book is. So you have Shuri realizing that what's happening is kind of like an infection. It's the symbiotes going around and possessing people. So it, it's almost she's almost treating it like an infection. And uh, T'Challa sees it that way a little bit too, but he has a little bit more understanding of what the symbiotes are, having firsthand experience with them. I think so does Wakanda. I think there was a miniseries that came out a, a while ago that we'll probably cover at some point, but I can't remember if it's in the 616 universe or an alternate universe where there was um, a female soldier in Wakanda becoming a Venom or getting bonded to a symbiote. So I don't know if that's in 616 canon or not, uh, but uh, I'm judging by this, maybe not, by, by reading this. But this is just neat because you have T'Challa going, no, we have to take the fight to these creatures like just like when the scrolls invaded we gotta we gotta save wakanda and if we can save wakanda we can possibly help the rest of the world because new york is getting it the worst right now and so far it's just like these single dragons flying to other countries so they're once again just dealing with a single dragon i think that's probably the email that everyone got which is hey all you need to do to be a king in black tie-in is just write your write this character that you're writing and have them fight a, a symbiote dragon, and that's it. And some of the continuities make sense, you know, c connect and some don't. Sometimes the symbiotes bond with humans like they did in the Hulk book, and they melt the human's flesh off and they just have the bones. And then there's other times where they bond with humans and they and they, the human can still be saved underneath. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> I don't know. But in this one, I think they kind of do more of the saving of people, which I like, because uh, it's always good to see superheroes save people. So Shuri has a plan. She's going to go and learn a little bit about um, alchemy and things like this. And uh, so she gets this necklace and this pendant. She talks to like a panther god. And she creates this army of winged soldiers to go in to save people in Wakanda. So that was a pretty cool scene. And while that's happening, T'Challa is um, finding Ulysses S. Claw's claw and finding ways to improve on it. Because uh, obviously his claw shoots like vibrational waves 
And so he's like, all right, Ulysses, it's time that you paid up on your debt that you owe this country that you've stolen from and hurt over the years. So I thought that was freaking awesome, too. Uh, and then meanwhile, Okoye has uh, actually merged with like this um, energy being, this panther god being, and fights the dragon. So it's like a kind of like two giant monsters fighting each other kind of thing, which, you know me, I'm not a kaiju fan. I'm not a, a fan of stuff like that too much. But it's like a good one page of battle. And I was like, all right, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, and meanwhile, while that's happening, Shuri, who's now been taken over by the symbiote dragon, after it got defeated and it spread out and started uh, taking over people, one of the people got is Shuri. So the at the end, it's actually Shuri and uh, T'Challa fighting each other. And T'Challa has to try to outsmart his sister, which is tough because although he's a good strategist, uh, he is not like his Shuri is smart. She's super smart, especially tech smart. So he's like, all right, I got to come up with a strategy, but it's one that she won't think about. So he grabs the, the you know, the, the claw uh, from Ulysses S. Claw and goes to shoot her. And he knew she was going to dodge it. And then so she's like, yeah, you thought you were going to hit me with that? And he goes, nope, I was hoping you would dodge it. And it blew a hole in the wall so he could jump out and he could get closer to this machine that was at the center of... Um, or no, yeah, he runs past, I, know, I thought it was a machine, but no, he actually runs outside the building, jumps out the building, uh, and then runs up the giant panther statue, that's what it was, and then from there, he takes the claw, which he, you know, super powered up, and shoots it up into the force field that goes over Wakanda, and while he's doing that, it sends this vibration all through Wakanda, so everything that has a symbiote, which now, it's a ton of stuff, because that one dragon was just one dragon, but it burst into all these other smaller symbiotes and possessed like half of Wakanda or a good chunk of Wakanda. So then it's like, you know, T'Challa is on top of the panther shooting the beam up and all these symbiotes are climbing up the pan. It's really cool visuals and a lot of visuals that are probably influenced by the movie and stuff too, but I liked it. I thought that was really good. And so, uh, so as, as he's like shooting the beam up and all these symbiotes are climbing up the panther, it causes this vibrational thing and then it wipes out everything that is wearing a symbiote while still saving the people underneath in Wakanda. So everyone gets saved, which I really like. But then what's really cool is that it zooms out and it shows Earth. And Earth, remember, is covered in, a, in symbiotes, uh, much like, you know, Clintar was when it was caging Null. Well, now there's a hole in that cage. On, on Earth, there's a giant opening where you can actually see the planet Earth and Wakanda's down in it. Um, so they actually made a difference and they expanded their protection bubble that went out and up. So now this hole that's in the, you know, the, I guess the symbiotes that are covering the planet, now there's a hole there and it's permanent. Uh, so they can't get through. They're trying to get through and they can't. So I thought that was really cool. I don't know what kind of effect that's going to happen next, um, you know, or going into the next stuff. Cause I would love for you know, T'Challa, because the, the one thing I like that Jeffrey did too is he referenced Storm a lot, and he had T'Challa thinking about Storm, and he was like, I can't save Storm right now. I have to hope that someone out there, someone in New York can save her and help her. I have to save Wakanda right now. I have to make this sacrifice to help my people and trust that Storm can get through this and that someone will help her, like one of the X-Men. So I kind of like that he was conflicted at first in this. So it shows a nice story here with T'Challa and what his duty is to save his family and his friends um, and having to make the tough choice of not going after the woman he loves. But now that he's done this, maybe he can. So I'd be really interested to see this continue in some way or, or T'Challa play some role in the fifth issue of King and Black. But this is me holding my breath, which is not, not even for a millisecond. Uh, so I think it was just Jeffrey Thorne just telling a, a cool story here and showing that Wakanda was not going to yield uh, to this to this uh, invasion, which, of course, they're not going to. They're Wakanda. So uh, he even, as he's narrating, he's telling stories about his dad and stuff like that. And he says, you know, the one thing that's consistent about Wakanda is that, you know, the Black Panther is there and the Black Panther is forever. And that is why Wakanda is forever. So him and his sister, you know, at the end, Wakanda is forever. And you see, like, the symbiotes in the background trying to reclaim Wakanda and just not being able to do it. And that's like the final image of the book. So really cool. I honestly really like this one. And again, I'm not doing it just to kiss Jeff's butt. But <clears throat> the one thing I will say critically about this issue is what I say about all of them. If you made that the phalanx, if you made that the brood, if you made that any other creatures, it's still the same story. 
nothing changes by it not being symbiotes. So when you have a story that the villain is that interchangeable or the threat is that interchangeable, then it's not a good tie-in, in my opinion, to the event they're trying to tie into. So although this was neat and you got a moment where he shot a blast and made a hole in the symbiote covering the earth, you're like, hey, that should affect the story, right? I don't know, because there's only one issue of King and Black left, and I doubt it's going to have a, a moment, or maybe it'll be one panel, where they mention that Wakanda blew a hole, and maybe that weakened Null in some way. But if it happens, it's going to be one panel. And I, I would hardly say that's in, like impacting the story too much. Um, but I did like it here. So like I said, even if you did any other story, zombie virus, you know, phalanx, anything, you still would have had the same story. So that makes it, I think, a good story, just not a good King and Black story, uh, tie-in wise. Uh, if this was, again, just another single issue of uh, Black Panther comic written by Jeff Thorne, I would be like, yeah, I'm on board 100%. But with it being a tie-in to King and Black, it's kind of like, well, again, it's it doesn't feel massively essential, but it does feel more connected than something like the Union does, which I thought that was kind of meh as far as connection goes barely anything this felt a little bit more because they went into the science of it more they even reveal at some point that the symbiotes have a an, a that you know he's like what t'challa has been studying the symbiote over the years and it has uh, qualities that are not too unsimilar to unstable molecules which i thought that was neat because unstable molecules is basically the suits of the fantasy four that went into space with them and got affected so okay the symbiotes have been in the space too so or they're from space. So I thought that was kind of a neat little thing. Like if you want to look for some reaching, you know, uh, canon type stuff, I thought that was a neat thing. So I, it seems Jeff really did put an effort in and really did uh, focus on telling a story here with, you know, moments where characters have doubt and, and overcome things and, and use the weapon of an old enemy like Claw to like save the day. Um, I thought all that was really great. I thought it was really cool. So for that reason, I liked it. Again, I just was like, well, it didn't have to be King and Black, but there's enough in there to where it feels more connected than some of the other King and Black stuff. All right, next up, our final two books, which are Daredevil number 26 and number 27. And I'm so happy to talk about these because I'm a big fan of Chip Zdarsky, who's the writer of this. And then we also have Marco Cicchetto, who is the artist of this um, as well, along with a couple other artists. So I'll have the titles uh, popped up right there of the credits of this book. And what I like about this is, I mean, first of all, this is my favorite Marvel book right now. Uh, Daredevil is a character I really like a lot, but uh, and has a lot of good runs, even by Bendis, who did a really great run. Kevin Smith did a good run. Uh, Frank Miller did a great run. Uh, there's been a lot of really cool runs on this character. And uh, and I think Sadarsky's is one of the good ones, like one of the better ones. <laughs> like, honestly, this run has been a blast and everything he's doing with the character from a story standpoint and everything Marco Cicchetto, who I love his art. I love the old man Hawkeye story that he did. Um, I love a lot of the other stuff he's worked on in Marvel. This book is just beautiful looking. There is other artists on this book, so the, the quality kind of shifts sometimes page to page. Um, but the fact that Marco still did some of the work in this for tie-in issues to a big event book is awesome. Because a lot of times when you do tie-in issues, you don't, you just kind of, the main artist, you go, okay, you get two months to catch up on the monthly books, and then we'll bring in other artists. They do do that here, but you still get some Chichetto in there too, which is awesome. Um, so if you haven't been reading Daredevil, we're going to go into spoilers, but Daredevil is in prison right now, um, but as Daredevil. So Matt Murdock has his mask on. For some reason, he, you know how you get an orange jumpsuit when you go to jail? He has an orange mask <laughs> that they provided him, um, but I guess... Because of, I don't know, what the future, like the Superhero Registration Act thing kind of fell apart. So now if a superhero gets arrested, I guess they can keep their mask on. But apparently that's not the same for supervillains. And that's that gets brought to Matt Murdock's attention pretty early in this issue. When a guy comes up to him and says, you know what? I'm probably going to serve my full time here uh, because I'm black and I've done these things that, you know, I'm being accused of. And they gave me like a multiple year sentence. So I'm probably going to serve that whole sentence. But you, you get to come in and wear your mask, like white privilege, hello. Uh, and then he's like, but you're also going to uh, go back at, after you get out of here. You probably only serve a third of your sentence, maybe, maybe less. And then you're going to go back out into the world and you can be you know, a doctor, lawyer, whatever you are outside of this place, which I love that he said lawyer. Um, 
But, you know, so it's, again, I know some people will go like, ah, politics in my comics, blah, blah, blah. It's a perspective. And it, it's, it's, I don't mind that this character has that perspective. Because if you're, again, when you're writing characters, you want to give them a point of view. Whether it's a point of view you agree with or not, doesn't matter. Uh, he has a point of view. And his point of view is that Matt gets to wear his mask because he's a white guy. <laughs> and that he's got privilege. But you're going to find out that that's not actually fully the case. And actually, the person who's the warden of this jail already kind of has a personal thing against Matt because Matt arrested his son at one point. Um, so yeah, even though the guy says he's okay with it, he's like, eh, my son was a bad guy. You, you locked him up. It's justice. You know, that's a good thing. But you can tell he doesn't mean those words. And Matt can tell he's lying too. So, um, so Matt is in jail and he kind of gets, like I said, the uh, third degree from this one inmate. Uh, but then on the outside though, who's Daredevil? Who's protecting Hell's Kitchen? Well, that is Electra. Electra Nachios right now is trying to do her best to prove to Matt that she is, I don't know, worthy to be by his side, um, worthy to help him save the world. She's on this mission and she believes she can only accomplish it by doing it, like doing, you know, saving the city and the world with Matt. Like, I guess that's like a predestined thing. She needs to be my, by Matt's side and the two of them will, will do these things. But Matt doesn't want to kill. Matt doesn't want to do these the methods that she practices. So now she's trying to prove herself that she can be like Matt and not kill. So she's interrogating a guy at the beginning of the issue. And then she's going to kill him. And she's like, I want to kill him. But I'm not going to kill him. I think I've scared him enough. And that's what Matt would do. And even though Matt's in jail for murder right now, Electra is having a hard time, you know, believing that truly. So, uh, so it's, it's, I don't know, it's a really well done book. It's really awesome. Um, and then as she like tosses that guy aside, a dragon lands nearby. So here's my problem with this book a little bit. So again, I love Chip Zdarsky. I love his stuff, but I'm still going to have an issue with the way this is written as, as a King and Black tie-in. Uh, last time I checked Hell's Kitchens in New York, they should be able to see Sentinels, covered in symbiotes they should be seeing the x-men screaming you know uh being possessed uh cyclops eye, you know, eye beams going through buildings or whatever like they should be seeing all of that and she's not seeing any of it she's just fighting one dragon it's like and then the dragon breaks apart and it bonds with this uh this young girl's mom uh, this girl alice bonds bonds who's been in the book bonds with her mom and then the another part of it goes and bonds with typhoid mary who has been working with Wilson Fisk. So Wilson Fisk has, you know, he's going to be a, a part in the Thunderbolts book, and he did appear in the first issue of King in Black. He's like rallying all these supervillains together to go do things. They don't really reference that here, though. Uh, but, uh, but he's with Wesley and Typhoid Mary when the dragon hits. So Wilson, you know, Typhoid Mary is like head of his security. So, which, by the way, he's the mayor. He hires Typhoid Mary to be his head of security, and she's like, has her half her face painted and everything and you're just like why does anyone in new york believe this guy's a good guy <laughs> like come on it's so stupid like they i feel like sometimes they just write characters uh oh they write like civilians as just stupid people and i i don't i'm not a fan of that i'm like come on really but again this is like the 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 mayor thing is not something i think chip sadarsky came up with i think that was something that he inherited when he took on the character of the book so when he took on the daredevil book so, uh, so he's doing his best, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so Typhoid Mary. So she's, um, she, you know, Wilson Fisk gets away with Wesley. They get in their limo and drive off. She stays behind to fight the dragons and symbiotes. And then she gets possessed by them. And she becomes, you know, a nullified Typhoid Mary or whatever. And then meanwhile, the symbiotes get into the prison where Matt is. Which, by the way, you can see the symbiotes slink in with Matt's vision. It's actually pretty cool. I'm glad they did that. And then it possesses some cops and then, you know, uh, Matt has to kind of break out of his cell and fight them. And uh, meanwhile, that that criminal who came up to him earlier, that guy who came up to him earlier and uh, and, told, you know, told, gave him the third degree about his privilege. That guy shows up and there's, again, an, kind of an arc there. I like when they do that. Uh, you know, I like when writers set something up, you know, set something up and pay it off. You know, I, I think that's just storytelling one-on-one but so surprisingly a lot of writers don't do that um and fewer even do it well when they do do it so uh so i like this you know you have alice fighting with her mom and then her mom you know gets turned into a symbiote daredevil shows up aka electro 
uh, Electra, sorry, Electra shows up and she crashes a car into Alice's mom, who's now nullified. And then she gets out of the car and tries to help Alice get away. But as Electra says, she's like, this girl's kind of weak. She's young and she's skinny. She's not, you know, she's not very strong, it seems. She's having, and her mom is a monster now. So she's having trouble running for safety. I kind of like that they at least address that because a lot of times you're like, you see people go run and the person just can't seem to get away for whatever reason. I like that Chip Zdarsky took a second to kind of explain that this girl is just not that physically fit. She's not very strong. It's just made her a normal character. I'm like, oh, she's good. She's normal. Um, and, and she's also just dealt with some kind of loss because her mom is a monster now. So, uh, so while Electra is fighting her mom, uh, that's when Typhoid Mary shows up. So now she has to fight two symbiotes. Uh, and then meanwhile, back in prison, Matt has fought off the cops. But then he starts hearing a voice in his head, and that voice is Null. And Null can sense that Matt is a religious person who has a belief in God. And, and although Matt, like any Catholic, feels like he's not worthy of God's love, um, he Null is like, yeah, but I'm God. And you have my love if you want it. Just come to me. And then uh, that's when Matt gets possessed. He gets nullified and turns into a nullified uh, daredevil at the end. But then in issue two, they retcon that pretty quickly because Matt fights back, uh, which in a moment I really love where Noel kind of is showing up in Matt's vision. Like Matt can actually kind of see when, uh, when he's possessed by the, the Noel symbiote. And he can at least see clearly the visions of Noel because obviously Matt wouldn't really know what Noel looks like um, because Noel, like Matt can't see in that way. He can see shapes of people and get impressions of people, but he can't really like see the details for the most part. Um, and so Noel shows up and he can clearly see what Noel is like in his head. And I thought that was kind of neat of, of a thing to do with Matt. And then he says like, you know, we can do this in more together, you know, just, you know, um, just accept me as your God and, you know, be mine. And, and Matt uh, fights back and says, no, he goes, I do, I am trying to be good enough for a God out there, but you are not that God. And Matt stands his ground against Null. And then like Miles Morales did in Absolute Carnage, Matt takes control of the Null costume and uses it to fight off the other cops and save the other prisoners. It's so cool. And of course, now we're, we're not going to get any moments in King and Black 5 with Daredevil like this. But again, Chip Zdarsky's like, hey, this is my book. I'm writing it. And I want to make it the best I can and make this character as cool as I can. So because there's going to be readers who don't read Daredevil, but read Venom, are going to give my book a shot. I want to give them a reason to stay. Trust me, stay. Stay with this book. This book is the best book Marvel puts out every month, in my opinion. Um, it is consistently really good, focuses on character and story and pacing, um, and the art is beautiful. Even the fill-in artists that come in, beautiful stuff. So uh, so this issue here, like with uh, Elektra fighting Alice's mom and Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary kills Alice's mom, um, unfortunately, right in front of Alice, and Elektra has to then fight Typhoid Mary and get her away from Alice. I don't know why Typhoid Mary symbiote or nullified Typhoid Mary and Alice's mom nullified are fighting each other. I feel like once they're all nullified, don't they, they sh sure they have short, you know, traces of their personality, but I didn't think they would actually fight each other because I thought that was the whole thing with Null is that he has kind of control and influence over everyone. So I thought that was weird that he had, that Typhoid Mary was able to kill Alice's mom. But I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I guess I guess I'm I could be reading too much into that. Um, but uh, Electra does fight back and and tries to save Alice. And like I said, meanwhile over in prison, Matt Murdock as Daredevil or as as a nullified Daredevil is fighting the guards. But that's when that uh, the guy who came up to him earlier, who you know reminded Matt of his mask privilege, uh, he shows up. He says, he's like, what are you doing? Like, stop hurting those cops. And he's trying to talk sense into Matt. Because Matt, even though he's in control, he's still kind of, he's still hearing Noel's voice. So he's like trying to fight while hearing Noel in his head. So so this guy's like, like, listen to me, Daredevil. Like, don't do this. Like, don't hurt these cops any more than you already have. And he's like, just go. Just like, there's a, a broken window. Just get out of here. And Matt decides he's not going to go. He's not going to run away from this. And that he does deserve to be in jail. Because Matt truly believes that he 
killed somebody. Whether he's been framed or not, we're still going to wait to find out. But it seems like Matt accidentally killed somebody in the first story arc by Chip Starsky here. So he believes he should be in jail. He believes in justice. And he's like, if I'm guilty of, of a crime of killing somebody, I should be behind bars. So he's kind of here willingly. And so when he breaks into this room, he finds the, um, I guess, the, uh, the execution chamber or wherever you go and get um, electrocuted. Uh, so he finds that and goes in, straps himself to the chair, and then he like summons the symbiote like to go over and grab the switch and pull it down. But Null stops the symbiote and he's like, look, Mr. Murdoch, you're very strong and your faith is very strong, but you're not going to override the symbiote. I'm going to let you do it a little bit, but you're not going to get it to electrocute yourself so you can kill the symbiote. He's like, I'm not going to allow that to happen. He's like, so Null personally comes to Matt in a vision. He's like, so just yield to me and, uh, you know, stop with this nonsense, stop fighting back, stop with the faith business and just give in. And Matt's like, but I got to have faith. You know, he's like, uh, but not like in a George Michael kind of way, but he's like, he's kind of like, I, you know, I have to have faith. He goes, because I think that's the only way any of us are going to survive this is if we have a little bit of faith. And then it, the kind of the camera, if you will, cuts over and you see that prisoner from earlier who talked to Matt about his privilege. Uh, he goes and grabs the switch and he pulls it. And Noel's like, no, you know, and then Matt gets electrocuted. And falls to the ground. Luckily, his mask stays on, which is good because he wore the cap even to electrocute himself, and it didn't like burn anything away. Um, although there was, I think, at one point, some old school style masks that they put on your head to prevent your head from like exploding or, or goo coming out of your eyes or something like that or ears. Um, but uh, but yeah. So anyway, Matt's mask protected him, and he passes out on the ground in front of that uh, prisoner, and he's like. Uh, you know, like he's basically like, thank you. Like I, I had faith that you would help me. And, you know, so now I think Matt's going to have more allies, you know, in prison and stuff. But meanwhile, outside of prison, you have Electra Nachios as Daredevil fighting Typhoid Mary, trying to keep Alice alive and realizing I can't do this. Like I'm a strategist and I'm fighting this thing, but it's strong. But now I realize Typhoid Mary doesn't really care about me or this girl. I'm just in her way so that she can succumb to whoever she's talking to, because, you know, Typhoid Mary has voices in her head, but she's also talking to Null, and Electra hears that. So Electra kind of positions herself to jump out a window and have, um, you know, the Typhoid Mary chase after her, and then Electra hits, like, a cop car, and she slows her heart rate down and, and stops her breathing so that she'll look dead. And once Typhoid Mary sees her dead, she goes, okay, now I can go serve Null, and she runs off to serve Null. And then Electra takes a breath, gets up, and is like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Because obviously the fall still hurt her, but she was luckily still had enough strength to control her breathing and her heart rate. And then she sees the little girl Alice, and Alice is like, why is my mom dead? Why is this happening? And Electra once again feels sorrow. She, she now sees what it really is like for Matt Murdock to go out there and help people. And what happens when you fail at helping them, and you can't save their loved one. And now Electra's feeling that emotion too where this little girl's hugging or crying going why is this happening and uh and that's where the book ends so i'm sure they'll talk a little bit more about this because the next issue is still like it still has the same title of this series part and it's called part three but i don't think it's a king and black tie-in i think they took the king and black banner off and the king and black banner was just on these two issues so i just find it weird that in New York, they only they only fought one dragon, and then that dragon became this little girl's mom and Typhoid Mary, and then she just fought the two of those uh, beings. One killed the other, and then Electra, you know, didn't even defeat Typhoid Mary. She just let Typhoid Mary run off. So I don't know. So and I don't know in the next issue is where it's going to pick up. Is it how soon after King and Black it'll pick up? Will Typhoid Mary be back to human and working for Wilson Fisk? Like. I'm sure those questions will be answered. If the next issue is a King and Black tie-in, we'll definitely cover it. But when I looked at the solicitation, it didn't mention King and Black at all. So I'm going to guess it's not. Uh, but the ramifications of this story, if you want to find out what happens to Electra, what happens to Alice, uh, what happens to Typhoid Mary and Wilson Fisk and, and Matt Murdock and the prisoner that's with them uh, in jail, if you want to find out what happens to all these people, go read Daredevil. It's a freaking good book. It's the best book at Marvel. I can't say that enough. So, um, so yeah, please go read it. Like, keep reading it monthly. And if another issue is a King and Black tie-in, I'll cover it. 
But otherwise, if you want answers to all those questions, go read this book. Pick up issue 28 when it comes out and read it yourself and just become a fan of Chip Zdarsky and his, his run on this book. And also Chip Zdarsky will be doing a Spider-Man book coming up, like a What If Spider-Man, where What If Peter Parker was Venom, like where he just kept the suit and just lived years and years with the suit and what he would do over the years. And Chip Zdarsky is the guy who wrote Spider-Man Life Story, which pretty much brought me to tears and had a great Venom symbiote moment in that one with Peter Parker. So I trust the guy. I'm definitely going to read his uh, his Spider Shadow, whatever that book's called when it comes out, um, where, you know, Peter Parker's Venom. And we'll definitely cover it here on the show at some point, too. So uh, let me know what you think of all these issues. If you read them yourself, if you haven't, whatever it is, let me know down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. It is 2 a.m. right now. I need to get some sleep because I have to go to work in a few hours. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Whenever this goes up, I'll try to get it up over the weekend, uh, hopefully. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed the first video that went up earlier tonight. And also check me out on Mad Scientist Party Hour. I'll put a link to that down below. I was on their show this week. And, uh, and then, you know, Alex and I were on there. And Alex and I will be doing our show probably already aired before this did. But uh, I'll, I'll put a link down to that also, which is our Beyond the Source Wall. This week we're watching the Deathstroke animated movie. And we're going to be doing a fan commentary over that. So hopefully you check that out. And hopefully you tune in on Thursday nights with us if you're a DC fan. Because we watch the DC animated movies on HBO Max. And we do fan commentaries and hang out and talk and chat with you guys. So definitely join us for that too. So uh, more Venom stuff very soon. I promise you that. Thank you so much. See you in the future. Cam, thank you again. Peace.